Okay, cool. Uh, and we're live. So welcome back, everybody. Um, yeah, we're getting into some of the really, really exciting stuff in, uh, in Calc 2, some of these, this end game material in Calc 2. Uh, and you were asked for, uh, to, I mean, as part of your prep work for class today, you were asked to look at Taylor series. Um, and we're going to deal, or we're going to mess around with Taylor series a little bit today. Uh, so Taylor series, in many ways, are, are sort of a culminating moment in the semester. Uh, and hopefully you should see, oh wait, which, which screen did I actually share with you? Uh, you should see this, this slide on Taylor series. Let me know if you see that. Let me know if you don't see that. I actually don't remember what slide I shared with you, either the correct one or the incorrect one. Um, but what were we just saying? Yeah, so Taylor series are the, uh, in many ways, they're a very culminating moment in the semester. They are perfect. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Taylor series are a sort of coming together of many different elements of the class. Uh, of course, these infinite sequences and series are part of it. Uh, and we deal with series convergence and sequence convergence. Uh, we also return to functions, right? And looking at functions, and that's because a Taylor series does represent a function um, on a certain radius of convergence. Uh, and what we'll see, what we have seen, maybe what we will see, uh, is that we can use Taylor series in kind of interesting ways, right? By relating them to functions and they will allow us to do things that we couldn't previously do. Things like um, uh, integrate expressions that were previously, uh, you know, non-integrable or, or that we did not have a nice formula in which we could integrate. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's these excellent, excellent sort of um, coming togethers of, of different threads of calculus too. So it's the, the closest thing that we have to a, a fundamental theorem of calculus moment, right? In Calc 1, the FTC sort of brought together integrals and derivatives in this really meaningful way. And when talking about Taylor series, we can bring together sort of functions and function integration, as well as series and series convergence in some sort of meaningful way. Uh, and so this is sort of a, a culminating moment in the class. Um, looking forward just a moment, uh, after today's class, we will actually, you know, we will really be near the end of the semester. And so at that point, um, or I should say after today, the rest of the semester will just involve a selection of different selected topics uh, that are worth seeing both if you are continuing in mathematics, so they come up again in, in Calculus 3 and in future math classes, um, and are worth sort of peeking into or, or getting a sense of if you are, if this is your final math class that you're taking and you're hoping to use math in an applied way uh, in your, your major of choice. Um, so those will be topics such as parametric equations and polar uh, coordinates or other coordinate systems, uh, just to say those words out loud. And those will be the things that we look at over the next several classes after this one. Um, so it's kind of a fun moment uh, to talk about Taylor series. Let's jump into it. Um, and these are some of our goals for today, including Clever Lee manipulating Taylor series and functions and sort of drawing connections between the two. Um, cool. So let's get into it. Um, first of all, I wanted to throw this slide up here. Um, this is just taken directly from our previous videos and from the uh, activity sheet. In essence, a Taylor series is a series, it's a power series that has this formula right here, right? So it's a, a infinite series, it's a power series, so it has a coefficient out front times an x minus a raised to the n. That's what the individual terms look like. Uh, and a Taylor series, as we saw, has this special form where the coefficient out front, this c sub n, um, as it's written up here, the c sub n has the following form. It is the nth derivative of f evaluated at the point a divided by n factorial. Um, and so what we can see then is that indeed, uh, 
yes, this expression out here is just, is just some number, right? When we take the nth derivative of f and we plug in a, we do in fact just get a constant up here divided by an n factorial, that's another constant. And so this is just a constant times x minus a to the n. So it does have this power series uh, uh, structure to it. Uh, because it is a power, because it has a power series structure, we know that there is some radius of convergence centered around the point A, or I should say there is some radius of convergence, and for the x values within the radius of convergence that are centered around the point A, um, this expression converges to some function which we can call f of x. Uh, and the sort of magic of Taylor series is that if we construct the coefficients in this form, then this series converges faithfully to that original function f of x. In other words, this formulation of a power series, we could do that for, for any function, or I should say we could, I'm saying that backwards, let me say that one more time. For a power series, we could create a power series with any coefficient c sub n, but for a Taylor series, uh, what we'll find is that our function f of x actually has the coefficients that are equal to um, this formulation right here. And the uh, sort of boxed theorem that we saw in the activity sheet slash the, the previous videos were that if I'm representing any function with a power series, so if this expression holds true, then it is actually the fact that the C sub n's will always take this form, right? Um, so we, these are sort of the big ideas in our, or this is the big theorem involving Taylor series. When A is equal to zero, we call this a Maclaurin series. Uh, and that has this, this much simpler looking form. Um, it's really the same thing, just with A equals zero. So right off the bat, we are interested in knowing whether or, or we are interested in knowing what some Taylor series representations are for some of our favorite functions that we've looked at um, over the past year, over the past two semesters. Uh, and so we'll identify these Maclaurin series because it's a little bit n nicer. Uh, in the activity sheet, I had sort of listed these as a bunch of um, empty equal signs, the idea being that we would derive all of these in class. Um, but then I was thinking about it and I realized it would actually probably be a little bit boring, <laughs> a little bit boring to, to watch me derive all of these. Um, especially since two of them, the e to the x and the sine of x, were done in the uh, videos leading up to today. And so I thought that it would be not the most interesting class to just watch me derive the rest. So instead, um, I've go ahead, gone ahead and written up these formulas. Um, just to keep it a little cleaner on the screen, I've not included the uh, like sum from n equals zero to infinity. Uh, but you can imagine that those are out front of each of these. Uh, and so what this ends up looking like, right, if we want to imagine what these first few look like, I'll just point out that this looks like 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed uh, plus dot, dot, dot. Um, that this next one, well, actually, let me, let me uh, keep talking about number one and I'll talk about each of these sort of in turn. Um, so this expression, we expect to be true uh, because this actually is a geometric series, right? So sort of a fun observation we can make is that this is a geometric series. And we know that geometric series have this, uh, this first coefficient, uh, call it C, and then we have uh, the common ratio to go from one term to the next to the next, and in this case, that's X, right? So I have to multiply by X to get to this term. I have to multiply by another X to get to this term, another X to get to this term, and so on. Uh, so this is just a geometric series, and a geometric series we know converges to uh, an expression of the form C divided by one minus that common ratio, right? That was our formula for, for geometric series. Uh, and so in this case, it makes sense that this series would converge to this expression. Uh, however, we could also rigorously derive this by using our Taylor series understanding 
from, from before, right? So in particular, I would take this expression, I would uh, evaluate it at zero, so I'd get one over one equals one, uh, and that would be my coefficient for the zeroth term. I could then take this derivative, evaluate that at zero, um, and that would be the coefficient for the next term. I could take the second derivative, evaluate it at zero, and that would be the coefficient for the third term, and so on and so on. Uh, and it just so happens that in this case, um, I'll sort of put this off to the, to the left in parentheses. In this case, we have that the nth derivative of f when evaluated at zero is actually equal to n factorial, right? So if I wanted to take the fourth derivative of this expression uh, and evaluate it at zero, I would end up getting four factorial as my answer or 24 as my answer. Uh, and that's kind of awesome because scrolling back a moment, uh, I would end up getting an expression that looked like n factorial divided by n factorial, those would cancel out and I would just be left with that x to the n. So that's why this has the expression that looks like it's just one times uh, x to the n. Okay, this also brings up an important question about where this uh, equality actually makes sense, right? So what x values or for which x values am I allowed to say that this function is equal to this Taylor series or this Maclaurin series? Uh, and that has to do with the radius of convergence of this series, which we could either rigorously calculate using the ratio test, or remember what the radius of convergence is for any geometric series, and it's for that radius less than one. So over here, I can also say that this is true um, for all x values less than one. Perfect. So we're interested here not only in, uh, right, figuring out what our function's Taylor series expression is, but also what the uh, radius of convergence is. Oh, hang on, I see I have a, a question here. Da, da, da. Oh, that's a great question. Thank you, Carson. So um, one thing that I, that I didn't explicitly do here is calculate any of these nth derivatives. I just made a bold statement that it would look like this. Um, Carson is asking uh, whether or not this should be, whether or not there should be an additional factor of negative one here, negative one to the n. So should this be an alternating series? Um, because when we take the derivative, we would end up uh, getting some negative exponents. Uh, it turns out the answer is no. Um, I think we have the right formula here, and I'm going to, as a very quick aside, here's an aside, it'll get, it'll get erased in a moment to make room for the rest of the slide. Um, but as an aside, let's notice that if I have f is equal to one over one minus x, that's also equal to one minus x raised to the negative one. Uh, and if I went to calculate the derivative here, I'll just calculate the first derivative. And, and Carson, I think this will directly address your question. If I calculate the first derivative, I'm calculating the derivative of this. And so by the chain rule, I think this is the key point. By the chain rule, we're going to get negative one times one minus x to the negative two. I think this is the, the negative that you were talking about. Um, but then by the chain rule, I have to multiply by the derivative of the inside, and that's the derivative of one minus x, and that will actually give me an additional negative one. And so I end up getting that this is a positive one minus x to the negative two. Uh, and then similar, uh, I'll, I'll just throw out one more. If I were to take the second derivative here, I would end up with a negative two, one minus x to the negative three, but again, times negative one, which would make this a positive expression. So all of these will end up being positive expressions and we won't have that alternating bit there. Um, I, pr I appreciate the question. What we'll actually see, um, this is not on our list, I'll add it as a super secret sixth element to the list. Um, what we'll actually see is if we had the expression one over one, plus 
x, and we were interested in that Taylor series expression, then the, the negative sign would not be cancelable, um, right? We wouldn't get that extra negative sign in the chain rule. And so we would end up getting that this would equal the sum from n goes from zero to infinity of negative one to the n times x to the n. And that would take that form one minus x plus x squared minus x cubed and so on. Cool. So yeah, super secret uh, sixth entry there. Yes, thanks for, thanks for keeping me honest. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Okay, um, any other questions just sort of talking through this, this first example? I'm going to erase this, this box in a second. Cool. Okay, let's go ahead and erase this. Um, there's not a good way to erase just a tiny bit of the screen except to quickly, rapidly move my mouse over it. Okay, um, so for the rest of these, I want to move slightly faster. Um, I simply want to identify what the sum looks like for the first few terms. So for example, e to the x, that would be 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 right? This is secretly zero factorial. There's secretly a zero factorial here. There's secretly a one factorial here. Two is just equal to two factorial. Uh, x cubed, this would be three factorial or six plus dot, dot, dot. So I want to, I want to just point out what the series looks like so you can gain some familiarity with it. And I also want to say what the radius of convergence is. So in the previous example, I could only plug in x values that were um, absolute value less than one. For e to the x, the radius of convergence is actually everything. So this is true for all real numbers x. And sometimes when I want to talk about all real numbers, I'll, I'll use this sort of fancy uppercase r here. So this is true for all real numbers or true for all r. Uh, when it comes to sine of x, right, like I said, I'll probably um, sort of breeze through a lot of these. Uh, when it comes to sine of x, that would equal, uh, let's make sure we get this right. So for the first term, this would be x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh, whoops, x to the seventh over seven factorial plus dot, dot, dot. So this has the alternating element to it and the exponents are all odd exponents. And this would be true for all real numbers once again. Uh, let me throw up the, the cosine one quickly and then the uh, inverse tangent, the arc tangent one, and then we'll pause and, and sort of identify some cool features here. So the cosine uh, is going to be similar to the sine, except it will involve even exponents. So this will become a 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial minus x to the sixth over 6 factorial, uh, and so on and so on. And again, this is true for all real numbers, right? So this uh, will converge, the series will converge um, at any x value. We'll get that that expression equals cosine. Uh, and then finally, we have the inverse tangent function, right? So inverse tangent, uh, dot, dot, dot. Let's see, this one is actually the one that I'm least comfortable with. So let me make sure we do this right. Uh, when n is zero, this will be x over one. Uh, and then we'll do a minus. Let's see, when n is equal to one, this is going to be a negative x cubed over three. Aha, okay, plus x to the fifth over five. Right, the key thing being here that there's not that factorial in the denominator, minus x to the seventh over seven, uh, plus dot, dot, dot. 
and this one is actually only true for x values less than one. Similarly, this bottom one uh, is true for x values less than one. Okay, um, and these are a number of our most important uh, Maclaurin series. Jose asks a great question, um, I think a, a super valid question. Will we have to remember these functions? I would say the ones that I absolutely want you to remember um, are going to be probably numbers, I would say numbers one, two, three, and four. Um, the inverse tangent one, I actually don't care that much about, if I'm being honest, uh, but I shouldn't probably say that. It's important, it's important, um, but I don't care that as much about it. These first four I care a lot about. Um, they will come up in this class, and I would like you to remember them. They will also come up in future math classes. Uh, and so one of the reasons I want you to, to remember them is because they do come up reasonably often. Um, so definitely, I'll just go ahead and sort of gold star those. Definitely go ahead and remember, oh, you can't even see the gold star. Uh, I'll, I'll light blue star these. Go ahead and remember these first four. Okay, so some cool things to point out. Thing number one, well, maybe one cool thing to point out. Let's say that. I love looking at sine and cosine next to each other. Um, and I think, you know, speaking of trying to memorize these, I think it's really easier to remember these or to memorize these in conjunction with each other because they're so similar and yet kind of opposite, right? So we have the cosine uh, is one minus x squared over two factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial. It has this alternating expression involving all of these even powers, uh, while the sine function up here is again alternating, but has all of these odd powers, right? So x to the first, uh, x cubed, x to the fifth, x to the seventh. Uh, and I think that's super interesting in part because when we remember the kind of symmetry that these exhibit, we remember that we always said sine exhibited odd symmetry, right? And what we said was that odd symmetry, boop, odd symmetry means that it's uh, rotational symmetry, right? Which means that when I graphed my sine function, it had this, uh, this rotational symmetry about the origin. Um, and that was an example of odd symmetry. Uh, well, it turns out that odd polynomials, polynomials of odd degree, also exhibit odd symmetry, right? So x cubed has odd symmetry, x to the fifth has odd symmetry. And so it's reasonable that a function with odd symmetry is a function whose Maclaurin series only contains odd powers. Right, so something about the oddness of sine is wrapped up in which powers we have here as far as the, the, um, the odd powers of the Maclaurin series. Similarly, we've got the cosine function, which we've always said exhibits even symmetry, right? And even symmetry, as we might remember, was symmetry that involved uh, reflection, right? So reflection across the y-axis. So whatever I drew over here, I'd have to draw over here in this sort of uh, reflection symmetry. Uh, and of course, even exponented uh, polynomials exhibit even symmetry. So constant functions have even symmetry. Uh, X squared has even symmetry. X to the fourth has even symmetry. And so if we're trying to remember which of these is sine and which is cosine, I think it's really re uh, uh, helpful to remember that the sine function has odd symmetry and so it has all of these odd exponents. And similarly, yikes, sorry team. Similarly, uh, cosine, what is going on? Hmm, okay. Uh, similarly, cosine with all of its even symmetry, there we go, uh, has all of these even polynomial exponents. And I think that's a great way to, to differentiate these two in your mind. All right, any questions, comments, or concerns uh, about anything on this slide for the moment? We got my cat who came in here to say hi. It's a little, 
little carrot cat there. She's attention seeking, I think. So we'll see how disruptive she gets. Yeah, any questions? Carrot, I said hi. She also says hi. She says hi back. Hi, Carrot. Okay, let's let's jump into things. Let's see if your tail will move. Um, let's see what else we can do here. So, I'm going to clear this for the moment. Uh, we'll refer to those series as we as we need to going forward. But one thing that I want to uh, say is that Taylor series often behave really nicely. When it comes to addition, uh, when it comes to function manipulation, right, or, or sort of creating new functions. Um, so, in other words, if I have a function f and I have a function g, I can think about what it means to take f plus g, to take f times g, to take f of g, right, so to compose the two functions, um, as well as taking, say, for a given function f, taking the derivative of f or taking the antiderivative of f. Um, and Taylor series, it turns out, behave really, really nicely with respect to all of these different uh, function manipulations. So addition and subtraction of functions, we do this term by term. Uh, multiplication of functions, we multiply the terms together. Derivatives and antiderivatives can be computed term by term. Uh, the final thing that I uh, don't have on this list uh, that I forgot to add is function composition. Right, so if I have like an f of g of x, we can say plug g into x in the Taylor series. And we'll see an example of this in a little bit. Um, so it turns out that all of these behave really, really nicely uh, with Taylor series. And I want to talk through um, a quick example. In fact, uh, give me one second. I'm going to sneak ahead and make sure. Yeah, yeah, look at that. OK, so I actually want to talk through an example, maybe two examples, that are not on the activity sheet explicitly. Um, but they're super, super worthwhile, and I think uh, kind of highlight the magic of Taylor series. Um, in fact, I'm sort of kicking myself for not putting them on the activity sheet. They should have been there. My apologies. Uh, I'll just do them on the bottom of this slide. Uh, number one, we have the expression for sine of x, right? And we have the expression for cosine of x. And we know, right, because we learned it in Calc 1, and it was one of our favorite things from Calc 1, that if I take the derivative of sine x, we get cosine of x, right? The derivative of sine is cosine. We've known this uh, since early October. Let's see what happens. Notice, if I take the Taylor series or the Maclaurin series for sine, right? That's the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity. We get negative 1 to the n. We have x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. Um, this is, sorry, I should clarify this is sine. Uh, but that's equal to, I'll just write out the first several terms. Right? Again, that was equal to, let's try to get this right, that was equal to x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh. I think I did that same typo on the last slide too. x to the seventh over 7 factorial uh, plus, I'll do one more, x to the ninth over 9 factorial. And I go to take the derivative of this, right? So the derivative of sine, I'm trying to take the derivative of that expression, and that's going to be the derivative of all of this stuff. 
Um, well, according to what we are saying here, I can take derivatives of Taylor series term by term. In other words, I can take the derivative of this by taking the derivative of x, the derivative of this, the derivative of that, and just adding and subtracting those derivatives term by term. So the derivative of x we know is just equal to one. Uh, the derivative of, of this next expression, right? Well, the three factorial will remain the same in the denominator uh, because it's just a constant, right? It's just six but the x cubed will become a three x squared. The x to the fifth will become a five x to the fourth. The x to the seventh will become a seven x to the sixth. And the x to the ninth will become a nine x to the eighth and so on and so on, right? So I can take the derivatives of these in a reasonably straightforward manner. And when I go to write that, and I'll rewrite it sort of down here, what we end up getting is one minus, and now let's think through this, because this will be the key to, to the rest of these. The three factorial is just, right? Three factorial is the same thing as one times two times three. And so one times two times three in the denominator, three in the numerator, that three will cancel with this three, and I end up with a one times two in the denominator. In other words, that x cubed divided by three factorial, when I take its derivative, becomes an x squared over two factorial, like that. Similarly, our next term will end up with a uh, x to the fourth, and then a five divided by five factorial becomes a four factorial. Hey girl. And next we end up with this, uh, 7x to the 6th over 7 factorial, that becomes an x to the 6th over 6 factorial. And we see that what we're actually doing is we are nicely getting the sum that is the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of, if I wanted, I could write this as, so I could write this in a number of different ways. Um, if I'm just straight up deriving this expression, I'll point out that I could write that as negative one to the n times, and now here's the derivative part, that's two n plus one x to the two n divided by two n plus one factorial. Right, so the constants don't change. The only thing that changed was I used the power rule to take the derivative of this. But if I wanted, and I do, uh, I could divide, I could um, take the 2n plus 1 out of both the top and bottom, and then the denominator just becomes a 2n factorial. And what I have is exactly the power series that we originally had for cosine. And so this is nothing more than cosine of x. And so what we have determined is that the derivative of sine is cosine, but we've done it in this kind of awesome power series move. Uh, there's a question about uh, how I took the derivative. Should I use the quotient rule? I could use the quotient rule, but I think that would overly complicate things. In particular, notice the denominator is just a constant number, right? The denominator is, I mean, maybe it's some big number, but it's a number. And so when I take the derivative of that number, I would just get zero. So the quotient rule could be used, but it simplifies down to just carrying the constant. In fact, both constants, the negative one and the denominator, the two n plus one factorial, we can just carry that through the, uh, the derivation, the derivative taking um, by the constant multiple rule. So the only piece uh, where we actually need to take the derivative is the x to the two n plus one. And when we take the derivative of that, we just use the power rule. Uh, and so we just shift the, um, the, the exponent slightly using the power rule.
So Jose, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, this also highlights a really awesome thing about power series um, or Taylor series, which is that taking derivatives and taking antiderivatives only ever requires the power rule and the antiderivative power rule, right? When I'm taking the derivative of a series like this, it's similar to taking the derivative of a polynomial. All I need to do is use the power rule term by term by term. Uh, and as a result, it is sometimes easier to take a derivative or an antiderivative in this setting than it would have been to take a derivative or antiderivative in this setting. All right, so here are our different worlds coming together. If I know what the Taylor series expansion is, I can take a derivative or an antiderivative, um, sometimes in a much more straightforward manner than using those uh, crazy integration techniques from the earlier part in the semester. Um, so was it important to learn those? Absolutely. Um, Taylor series expansions are sometimes really hard to find if we're not dealing with e to the x, sine x, cosine of x, our nice, easy, uh, you know, uh, easy functions that we know and love. Um, but if we do know those expansions, sometimes it's more straightforward to use the Taylor series expansion and deal with that. So um, I'm not actually gonna go through this other example. Um, I wanna get through a certain number of other problems on this activity sheet during our time here today. But sometime today, after you watch this video, especially if the weather is nice, you can sit outside while you do this. Um, Sometime today, I highly, highly encourage you to go through and try to verify that if you take the function e to the x and you take the derivative of e to the x, you get e to the x again, right? And do this using uh, Taylor series or Maclaurin series. All right, so use the Maclaurin series expansion for e to the x, take its derivative, and verify that you actually get e to the x back in that case. Um, super, super worthwhile, uh, and I would encourage you to, to take a moment to do that. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, we want to start uh, seeing what's happening with these other kinds of ways we can manipulate Taylor series. Uh, and I'm gonna choose a smattering of problems from the rest of the activity sheet. Uh, let's say, for example, in the problem two, we are encouraged to construct Taylor series through function composition with other Taylor series that we already know. Um, I'm gonna choose, I think we could really do any of these. Let's try to do, Oh, I don't know. Let's try to do that last one. Why not? Uh, so e to the negative x cubed, right? Well, I know what the Taylor series expansion for e to the x is, right? So e to the x is equal to the sum, n goes from zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. Right, and again, if I wanted to write out the first several terms, I'll often do this just to gain a sense of what my series looks like. Right, the first several terms of e to the x, that was one plus x plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over three factorial. I'll do one more, I guess, plus x to the fourth over four factorial plus dot, dot, dot. If I wanted to not find the power series or the Maclaurin series expansion for e to the x, but instead e to the negative x cubed, well, what we said on the previous slide is that we can do this by taking our Taylor series expansion for e to the x, which we know and love, and simply replacing all of the x's with negative x cubed. What that means is we're going to end up with this as our Taylor series expansion, right? Negative x cubed over n factorial. And in fact, I can write that in a, in a more straightforward form. By rules of exponents, 
right, the negative x cubed to the n, I could write that as a negative 1 to the n times an x cubed to the n. And I might write the x cubed to the n as just x raised to the 3n over n factorial. Right, and as I start to plug in things over here, maybe I should have done this first, I can simply replace every instance of an x with a negative x cubed. Right, let's be careful here. This should become a negative x cubed squared right there. And this will be a negative x cubed to the third a negative x cubed to the fourth. So we have to make sure that we are truly plugging in the negative x cubed for x every single step along the way. Um, but that simplifies down to 1 minus x cubed plus x to the sixth over 2 factorial minus x to the ninth over 3 factorial. Sorry, that should be a 9, x to the 9. Uh, plus an x to the 12th over 4 factorial, and so on and so on, right? And I should say these other problems are, are similar, right? These other problems are very similar. So this gives us a slick way to express a function, or I should say to re-express a function that was previously challenging to work with in terms of a power series, which might be slightly more straightforward to work with. Any question, and I, yeah, so these other two examples, example one and two, follow uh, in a similar manner to example three. Any questions about how we did that? Okay, cool. So, to go slightly off script one more time, and then I promise we'll be on script for the rest of the, the, rest of the class, uh, but to go slightly off script for one more time, um, this gives us a way to at least begin to wrestle with integrals that we previously could not wrestle with. So the expression x to the negative, or e to the negative x cubed, if I had asked you back in the early part of the semester to find an antiderivative for that, I don't think we could have done it. Um, have to think through that a little bit, but we could go through u substitution, integration by parts, uh, partial fractions. None of those things seem to really work because, you know, typically if I have an e to the negative x cubed and that negative x cubed is all in the exponent, we might have to have some additional like 3x squared or something similar um, to make our u substitution work. In short, this would have been a challenging problem to wrestle with early in the semester um, if it came to finding an antiderivative of it. But if I asked you today to find an antiderivative of this, we could find not a nice closed form formula for it, but we could find an antiderivative for the Taylor series expansion or the Maclaurin series expansion by integrating each of these terms separately, right? And so in doing so, I could have come up with the following expression and I don't think we'll end up with a, oh no, we couldn't get a nice formula for it, um, right? I'll write right in there. To find a nice formula for this, I would have to use the anti-power rule. So this would become x to the 3n plus 1 divided by 3n plus 1. And so we get this thing as our antiderivative, right? It's not a nice closed formula, but it is a nice Taylor series formula. Specifically, it would be an alternating series in which we would have x to the 3n plus 1 divided by 3n plus 1 times n factorial, right? And I could rewrite that if I wanted as this would become an x. If I wanted to integrate term by term, this would become an x. This would become an n to the x to the fourth over 4. This would become an x to the seventh over 7 times 2 factorial. 
this would become an x to the 10th over 10 times 3 factorial, an x to the 13th over 13 times 4 factorial, and so on. So we end up with this really kind of ugly formula, but it is a meaningful way to interpret the antiderivative of an expression in which we previously could not find a nice closed form antiderivative. So that's kind of awesome. Uh, yeah, full stop, just kind of awesome. Okay, back on script and moving along. Okay, cool. So actually, this is um, a very similar problem. Let's say we wanted to evaluate this integral right here. This is an integral that we could not wrestle with previous to power series, or rather we could not find a nice closed formula, closed form formula for this previous to power series. Our usual techniques, integration by parts, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. None of those techniques would give us a nice way to express this. But using our new understanding of power series, we can do the following, right? So we can start by writing the expression for sine of x. That will equal, um, and I'll just do this, uh, you know, sort of in the long hand form. So this is a, whoops, it's not a one, it's an x. So it's an x minus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the fifth over five factorial minus x to the seventh over seven factorial. Why do I always write the seven first? x to the seventh over seven factorial plus dot, dot, dot. I feel like that's got to be some sort of interesting insight into how my, my brain is wired, that I will always write that seven first. Um, so this is the power series for sine of x. To try to evaluate this integral or to find an antiderivative for this integral, I could start by dividing sine of x by x, right? And that's like dividing each of these terms by x. So this becomes, well, actually, I'll write it in several different stages. So this uh, sine of x divided by x, that becomes a 1 minus. If I divide by x, this becomes an x squared over 3 factorial plus an x to the fourth over 4 factorial minus an x to the sixth over 6 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. Uh, and then if I wanted to integrate this, right, so then I could take the integral of sine x over x. Well, I could do that by integrating each of the terms in the previous line separately, right? And so if I integrate that, that one will once again become an x minus, this becomes an x cubed over three times three factorial, right? So let's remember the three factorial would stay there the x squared would become an x cubed over three. So we get three times three factorial plus, now we have an x to the fifth over five times five factorial minus, we have an x to the, my goodness, <laughs> an x to the seventh over seven times seven factorial. Uh, and so on and so on. So in fact, we actually do get a nice formula for this expression in terms of power series. Notice it looks almost identical to the power series for sine, right? So sine x over x, almost identical to the power series for sine in that it is the sum, as n goes from zero to infinity of negative one to the n times x to the 2n plus 1 divided by, and then down here we will end up with an n times n factorial, right? So it's almost the, uh, I'm sorry, an n, not an n, but rather a 2n plus 1 times a 2n plus 1 factorial, right? So we're just getting the odd 
powers here. Okay, uh, quick question over here. So would the factorials not stay the same uh, and just be multiplied by the new exponent in the top? So I do think the factorials stay the same. Oh, oh, I totally see what you say, what you what you're saying here, Katie. Yes, you're totally right. Uh, there's a typo here. Thank you. Um, I fixed it in the red line. It looks like, but I did not fix it in the purple line. Um, so this four factorial and that six factorial should stay a five factorial and a seven factorial. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, when we divide by x. Right, this x to the seventh becomes an x to the sixth, but that seven factorial doesn't change, it stays a seven factorial, which is important because when we get down here, it again doesn't change, it stays a seven factorial. So yes, thank you so much. I think, I think that fixes the, the typo. Any, any other typos or any questions about this example? Um, a wonderful takeaway message is that we have a way to um, evaluate this antiderivative at different values of x to get a completely accurate answer, even though I don't have a nice closed form way to write sine of x over x, the antiderivative of sine of x over x. When I say closed form, I mean sort of a short formula that doesn't resort to infinite uh, polynomials or infinite Taylor series. So there's no short way to write this, but there is a Taylor series way to write and evaluate this. And as always, when we're taking general antiderivatives, I should probably throw a big old plus C there at the end as well. Okay, cool, love it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, let's see what else we've got going on. Um, I'm going to save problem four for the very end because um, it's sort of a different beast of a problem, but still worth talking about. I actually love that one. Uh, let's skip ahead to problem five very quickly. This goes along with our theme of Maclaurin series manipulation. Um, going back to, to this slide here, this is involving multiplication of functions. Right? So if I have the function f of x equals e to the x times sine of x, and I want to find a nice Maclaurin series that describes this, uh, I cannot write nicely, and we will not in this class write nicely, a short formula for the Maclaurin series of e to the x times sine of x. Um, what I can do is I can write that as follows. So e to the x times sine of x is equal to, well, I have my power series expansion for e to the x, right? So that was the sum of x to the n over n factorial times power series expansion for sine. That was negative one to the n times two n plus one factor, uh, whoop, got that backwards. That should be x to the two n plus one over 2n plus 1 factorial. Um, and so I can actually multiply these out as follows. I'm going to write the first several terms out. So for e to the x, that was 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial. Um, plus dot, 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 times, and then for sine of x, this was x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus uh, x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus dot, dot, dot. Uh, and so when it comes time to multiply these out, I can do that as follows. I can multiply the way that I normally would right, multiplying in a distributive manner where I'm multiplying each of the terms over here by each of the terms over here. And then I can group, you know, sort of similar order polynomial terms together. In other words, I can group all of the x squared terms together. I can group all of the x cubed terms together. 
and so on. And because each of these expressions are infinite, I cannot at the moment write these in a nice closed form the way that I might hope. Um, so I might not come up with a formula in total, but for the purposes of um, approximation, I can write out the first several terms, right? So in this case, we're saying the first four terms. Uh, in other words, I can write out everything that has an exponent of, let's say x to the fifth or lower. So maybe that's the first six terms, x to the fifth or lower. Uh, and I can do this as follows, right? So I can just start multiplying these out. So if I wanna write out everything, um, and I'll, I'll just make a note of that up here, um, instead of the first four terms, I think we're saying the first six terms, and so that's x to the fifth or lower. Right, well I can just start multiplying these out. So I would end up with one times x, plus one times that, plus one times that. Uh, and let me just go ahead and, and actually write those out. So that's one plus, uh, I guess it's a negative one sixth x cubed, right? That's where I'm getting the one times that term, uh, plus a, what is that? Five factorial is 120. So that's one over 120 x to the fifth. And notice if I multiplied that one by anything up there, like the x to the seventh or the x to the ninth or whatever, that would be something larger than x to the fifth. That would be a higher order term, right? And sometimes I'll denote that as a hot, higher order term. So higher order terms uh, will be multiplied in there as well. Uh, plus, if I wanna go ahead and multiply these x's, uh, whoops, these x's, I would get x times x, x times x cubed over three factorial, uh, and let me write those out, that would be, so x times x, I'd end up with an x squared, uh, minus a one sixth x to the fourth, right? That was the x times x cubed over three factorial. Uh, plus, notice now if I multiply x by x to the fifth over five factorial, that would be an x to the sixth. That would be a higher order term. And everything else will also be higher order terms plus higher order terms. Uh, plus, if I multiply the x squared term through, right, the x squared term will become, uh, what would that become? That would become a x cubed over two minus x to the fifth over six, um, which I actually, I wanna keep writing it in the same sort of strat style that I've been writing the other ones. So let's write that as a, one half x cubed minus one sixth x to the fifth plus higher order terms. Okay, let's keep this going. I think we've only got one or two more. Uh, for the x cubed over three factorial, we just get an x to the fourth over three factorial. So that's a one sixth x to the fourth plus higher order terms. Right, because notice in that case, uh, I'm multiplying, we have this. Ah, yes, yeah, thank you, Carson, you're totally right. So uh, at the moment in the blue ink, I am multiplying x cubed over three factorial times x, that's where I'm getting the x to the fourth over three factorial. But if I go to multiply that times the next thing, I would get an x to the sixth, which is a higher order term. Uh, I think Carson is right here. I made a mistake in multiplying this times this, that should have been a negative one twelfth as opposed to a negative one sixth. I lost the, uh, the one half in my denominator. Okay, I think we've only got one more, right? When I multiply the x to the fourth in here times the x, I would get an x to the fifth. So I finally have an x to the fifth, uh, and that should be over four factorial. So one over 24, x to the fifth. 
plus higher order terms. And then everything else after that, right? I'm multiplying expressions further up in here by expressions further up in here. Everything else is a higher order term. So all that's left are these, are these higher order terms. Okay, great. And as a final step, what we could do is we could actually group these according to the polynomial order of the individual terms, right? So all of that taken together equals, uh, so there's only one constant, I think, in the entire thing. There's that one plus, if I want to group the x's together, right? So I've taken care of that one. If I want to group the x's together, uh, I realize that there are none. <laughs> so maybe I'll just be explicit about that and say plus zero x. Oh, should the first one be an x? Ah, oh, the first one should be an x. You're totally right because it's a one times an x. So yeah, so that should be an x. So let's fix that. Thank you, Carson, for pointing that out. Uh, boop, that should be an x. That actually changes what we have down here. So there are actually no first order terms. So we end up with a zero plus one x. Is that right? Yeah, just a single x, and we've taken care of that one. Uh, when it comes to x squared, we sort of comb through here. It looks like there's just a single x squared, right? And that came from the x times x. So that's going to be one, ah, stop that. One x squared plus, and now it starts to get a little interesting. So for the cube terms, right, there's a negative one sixth. That's this term up here. And there's a positive one half, that's this term down here. So it's negative one sixth plus one half x squared plus, and for the x cubes, I just did the, uh, I'm sorry, I just did the x cubes. That should have been an x cubed. My goodness, x cubed. So for the x to the fourths now, we've got a good number of them, uh, namely two. <laughs> we've got a negative x to the, uh, negative one sixth, right? That's another negative one sixth. So we got that. Plus one sixth, ooh. x to the fourth, and so those cancel. Uh, and then finally, the x to the fifths, it looks like we've got three of them. So we've got a one over 120, uh, minus 1 12th, plus 1 24th. Cool, okay, and assuming we didn't make any more mistakes, which is always doubtful, um, but assuming we got everything right there, we have actually found the, uh, a, a nice approximation for the Maclaurin series, at least up to the fifth term, right? So to introduce some old language, we found the fifth partial sum of the Maclaurin series for e to the x times sine of x. And for good measure, I could just say at the end here, everything else will be some higher order term. Okay. Great. Uh, I want to spend the rest of the time, and we have, yeah, about seven minutes or so. I want to spend the rest of the time doubling back to look at problem four, which I think is kind of a cool problem of a slightly different nature. Um, so all of the problems that we've been looking at so far have been about the relationship between Maclaurin series and the functions that they represent and how we can manipulate those through processes like multiplication, uh, function composition, integration, and so on. 
uh, to get new Maclaurin series representing new functions. This is a little different. Uh, this problem asks you to explicitly find the sum of a series, right? So we're back in the world of series and series convergence. Um, this is a series that converges, it turns out, and we could use the ratio test to show that it converges. The problem though is asking, what does this converge to? So not just does it converge, but what does it converge to? And a lot of our work on series had to do with series convergence or divergence, but we didn't talk that much about how to determine what a series converges to. That's because we didn't have the tools yet to really attack that problem. Now with Taylor series, we do. So we can figure out explicitly what this converges to by finding what Taylor series or what Maclaurin series this seems to be representing. And so let's think through this a little bit. Uh, what we have is an expression in which I, I have this, this common factor it looks like, this ln of two in each of these terms, right? So first I have ln of two, then it gets squared, then it gets cubed and so on. I also have uh, an alternating expression, right? So negative, positive, negative, positive, and so on. And I have the, uh, you know, sort of one secret one factorial, two factorial, three factorial, and so on and so on here. So my goal is to recognize this as a particular instance of a broader Taylor, or in this case, Maclaurin series. And so here's what we can do. It involves a little bit of insight. So we can notice this looks like, right, this looks like the function e to the x, specifically the Taylor series for e to the x. And let's think through this a little bit. So e to the x, as a reminder, was 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus dot, 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 right? So e to the x looked like, uh, I should say, e to the x could be represented by this Taylor polynomial. And this Taylor polynomial looks kind of similar to what we have going on up here. The difference being, of course, this is an explicit value, right? Instead of an x. And we have this alternating uh, thingy going on, right? This alternatingness of the series. So the alternatingness of the series can actually be taken care of in a kind of clever way. Let me rewrite the series up above as 1 plus negative ln of 2, right? So I'm just making that explicit distinction, uh, plus we're going to have this 2 factorial in the denominator. Let me write uh, not ln of 2 squared, but negative ln of 2 squared, because in the square, I'll get rid of the negative sign anyway. Uh, plus, and I can rewrite this as negative ln of 2 cubed over 3 factorial. Right? Notice when I cube that, I'll end up with a negative sign that will become, whoops, sorry, negative sign that will become uh, they turn this into a negative term, uh, and so on and so on. So I'm actually recognizing that I can absorb that negative sign into the ln piece and make that be something that's being squared or cubed or, or what have you. Um, so in fact, there is a direct line that I can draw between this expression and this expression, specifically by letting x equal negative ln of 2. Does everybody see that? So what I have here is really the expression e to the x explicitly in the case where x is equal to negative ln of 2. And so what that means is that the series, not only does it converge, but according to our understanding of Maclaurin series, this series should converge 
to e to the x, specifically when x is equal to negative ln of 2. Right? And by some algebra manip manipulation, e to the negative ln of 2, right? As a reminder, uh, we can write that as 1 over e to the ln of 2. And e to the ln of 2 is just 2. So in fact, that kind of weird Taylor polynomial, I'm sorry, that kind of weird series can be interpreted as a specific value of a Taylor polynomial, or a Taylor series, and we can figure out what it converges to by referring directly to the function, in this case, e to the x, that that series represents. Uh, and I think that's super, super cool. Uh, and if this seems like a little bit like, like magic, it is a little bit like magic, but it really works. And we can see that. And I'll, I'll sort of, I'll end class with this. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. I'm going to open up a new window to share with you all. Let's see. Okay, so hopefully now you should be seeing uh, this page, uh, just a browser, right? So this is just going to be my calculator. I can calculate what that series was out to several terms, right? So I can calculate one plus, and then what was it? It was, it was actually minus, wasn't it? It was one minus ln of two. So that's, you know, we can see here in the, in the orange that that's 0 0.3 uh, plus ln of 2 squared divided by 2 factorial. Okay, and at that point we're at 0 0.54. We can do minus ln of 2 cubed over 3 factorial. Okay, and now we're at 0 0.4915 plus ln of 2 to the 4th over 4 factorial minus minus uh, ln of 2 to the 5th over 5 factorial, and so on and so on. And we see that we are actually converging to the number 1 half here, right? So I think this helps illustrate the extreme power of these uh, power series or Taylor series or Maclaurin series. Uh, we can use them to find out what specific series converge to if we can interpret them appropriately as a uh, Taylor series for a function that we already understand. Okay, so I am going to stop the video there, uh, and I guess class is, is over, so it's an appropriate time to do that. Um, but this is a, like a really cool, and I've, I said this at the beginning, a really cool culminating moment in the class where we can um, address some of these, these longstanding questions by sort of seeing in parallel a function that we want to wrestle with and a series namely the corresponding uh, Maclaurin or Taylor series to that function. And we can answer really interesting questions by sort of translating between those two views of a given function. Uh, so have an absolutely wonderful rest of your day.